Hello, I'm Miss Kilburn Bond. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the poem The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And the objectives of this video are to support you in reading and understanding the feelings and attitudes in the poem, so that's assessment objective one from the GCSE, to explore and analyse the effect of language, form and structure in the poem, so that's AO2, that's where we really dig into the techniques that the poets used and the impact that they have. And then finally, for assessment objective three, AO3, we're going to look and appreciate the poem's context and how this impacts on meaning. So that means we're going to look at the time it was written, what we can find out about the poet, and how this information might help us understand the poem more. If you haven't already got the poem in front of you, then that would help, and perhaps some highlighters, pencils, something with which you can annotate. If you don't have that with you now, then you might want to just pause and get yourself ready. So I think for this poem it's important that we start with the historical context and we understand something about what the charge of the Light Brigade actually was. And to do that we need to look at some history and think about the Crimean War. So the Crimean War happened between 1853 and 1855 and it was a war between the Russian Empire and then an alliance, so a group of countries working together on the same team, the Ottoman Empire, so linked to what we now know as Turkey, Britain, France, the Italian Kingdom of Sardinia. And to simplify this, then if we think about Britain and France as being two of the sort of main powers against the Russians, they were very keen to stop Russia getting any more power in the Balkan area, the Middle East. So that is a very brief, sort of in a nutshell, version of what the Crimean War is about. Now it was a war that was notorious for logistical and tactical mistakes. So that means that throughout the war there were numerous stories of things that didn't really go to plan. And one of the reasons why that was the case is because it's one of the first conflicts where modern military technology, so guns, artillery shells, was really used. Before this, conflict was often in much shorter battles that would usually involve swords. This was one of the first sort of big wars where actually everything started to change and that meant that as people were trying to find their way through all these new ways of fighting then mistakes did happen. It was also the first time that soldiers from Britain really represented all classes of people. Previously soldiers were really taken from the upper classes and wars happened very much away from the public eye whereas now in the Crimean War the common ordinary man might be a soldier and would fight for their country and so what this led to was this emerging idea of being a British heroic soldier with a really strong sense of representing your country and all of this is going to help us understand the poem and the themes in this poem set within the Crimean War. This was the age of pageantry and splendour, when soldiers dreamt of glory and war was a glamorous game. It was a time of arrogance and power, of regiments resplendent on parade, and the richest and proudest of them all was the symbol of the British Empire, the heroic Light Brigade. So it can be quite helpful to think about what else we might want to know about this time in history and things that you might already know to help you understand. So Queen Victoria was on the throne and this was actually the time when the Victoria Cross, which you might have heard of people are still awarded the Victoria Cross today, was first introduced. So it's called the Victoria Cross after the Queen and it was a medal and award that was given for gallantry, so that means for extreme bravery on the battlefield, and it was given to a soldier regardless of their rank or their class. So the first time really in British history that an ordinary soldier could win such an award. And you can see there a picture or a painting of Queen Victoria awarding a Victoria Cross, which is that medal on the left hand side. Now the Crimean War is also well known for the story of Florence Nightingale, so the famous nurse who went to treat the soldiers in the Crimean War, and fortunately, increasingly, is also being known for another nurse, and that nurse is named Mary Seacole, which you might recognise from the John Agard poem that's also in this anthology. So we're in the Victorian period, and if you know anything about the Victorian period, 
you will already be aware that this was a time where Britain was in a moment of having great political and economic power and that was across the world because of the British Empire. So Britain, a very powerful country around the world, there was a very strong sense of pride about being British and what the nation of Britain stood for and all of this is going to help us understand the themes in this poem. It was also a society that was very strict, had very strong values that can be described as conservative values. So wanting to limit what people could do, being quite sort of old fashioned, resistant to things that would be considered to be new or challenging of ideas that people had held before. So quite a strict society in which to live. So in the middle of this context, we have the charge of the light brigade, which brings us to the title of the poem. So the charge of the Light Brigade was actually part of another battle near the city of Balaclava that's sometimes called the Battle of Balaclava from 1854. And the specific charge of the Light Brigade happened on October the 25th. Now you don't need to remember these dates in an exam, but this is all about trying to help you understand how the poem came to exist. So what happened with the charge of the Light Brigade is that the cavalry, so the soldiers on horseback, were charging through a valley and the valley is pictured on the screen now in the form of a photograph. So you can see on the left hand side you can actually see the cannonballs on the ground, in the middle through a military map and then on the right through a painting. And what you should be able to see from all of those images is this idea of this being a treeless valley that is ringed on three sides by raised ground and on these three sides as the British cavalry charged into this sort of narrow valley they were surrounded by is reported some 20 battalions of Russian infantry and artillery so you can see it's an extremely dangerous and vulnerable situation for these men on horseback to be riding into and be trapped as they were sort of funneled into the valley. Now you might be wondering, well, why send all of these soldiers into a valley like that? And this is where this story has become such a famous or infamous part of British military history. So the message for this charge came from Lord Raglan. And you can actually see a little bit of his handwriting in the message there. But Lord Raglan, this is a message, wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. Troop horse artillery may accompany French cavalry is on your left immediate. So that was the message that came through for the light brigade. Now, miscommunication absolutely happened, but what historians are not exactly clear on is whose responsibility this mistake was. But definitely it's clear that the Light Brigade received the wrong orders. We just don't know the full story about how that came to be. What matters though is that as a result of this order that was in some way wrong, then a huge tragedy occurred. And when the news of this tragedy came back to Britain, there was vigorous debate about what had happened and it's still a subject of intense interest today. And of course, what did happen is the tragic loss of life that we read about in the poem. And here we have a quote from a French marshal who was observing the charge of the Light Brigade and his really powerful words. C'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas la guerre, c'est de la folie. It is magnificent, but it isn't war. It is folly, stupidity, it is madness. And that really sums up what most people felt about this event. And this was a war which people were actually observing. People would go and sort of watch the battles from the high up ground and report on what was happening. So these reports were getting back to Britain and caused the controversy and it really was a disastrous result because only 247 of the men returned alive, many were injured and it became a national scandal and that's why if you do more research into the Charge of the Light Brigade you will find hundreds and hundreds of paintings and stories that are all inspired by this story and there's also a film if you wanted to watch an old film that tries to explore what happened. Now, I've already mentioned that this was a war that people wanted to find out about. In fact, it was the first, what we could call a media war. It's the first time in history that newspapers were able to carry eyewitness reports quickly in the sort of similar time scale to when the battles were happening. That hadn't really happened before. People would find out about battles 
a long time after and only really relying on the reports of the military. But where life was changing, journalists were able to send reports back from the battleground and that meant that the general British public didn't just hear about the triumphs of war, they heard about the horrors of war as well. Now the Charge of the Light Brigade was famously reported by the Times newspaper by a correspondent called William Howard Russell who became quite a celebrity in his time for the way that he wrote about these military incidents. And he reported on the charge of the Light Brigade and actually used the term blunder to describe that a mistake had been made. And this caused quite a sensation in the British public who started to question leadership within the military and the value of the battles that were happening abroad. So on the screen there's a quote from this same article which you can find online and read the whole thing if you wanted to. They swept proudly past, glittering in the morning sun in all the pride and splendour of war. We could hardly believe the evidence of our senses. Surely that handful of men were not going to charge an army in position. Alas, it was but too true. Their desperate valour knew no bounds, and far indeed was it removed from its so-called better part, discretion. So you can hear in that quotation the absolute shock and disbelief as Russell is watching the Light Brigade charge into what seems to be a certain death situation. And this very article was read by the poet Tennyson and it inspired his poem. So let's meet Alfred Lord Tennyson now. So Tennyson was the poet laureate. He actually followed Wordsworth, so another of the poets that you'll study in this anthology. He followed Wordsworth in being appointed by the Queen as the official poet of Britain, if you like. So his job is to capture the public mood and record sort of events of Great Britain. That means he's in a position of great power and prestige. He's seen as a really important cultural figure for the country. Now Tennyson, a very interesting character, if you want to read more about him, then yeah, there's a lot about his life. But what we need to know for this poem is just to know that he did support the war, the Crimean War, and he was very supportive of the monarchy and of the country generally. He was interested in preserving and upholding society. He wasn't a character who looked to criticise society, and that will explain the angle with which he takes in his poem. He's seen as being a true Victorian poet. He embodies all the values of Victorian society. So we can describe his poetry as conservative. He looks backwards to historical traditions in poetry. He doesn't experiment with new ideas. He looks back to classical literature. He looks for inspiration from poets who've come before him. And he writes in allegiance with the power structure in the country, which means that he's very loyal to the way that the country's run. But... What made his poem so well known and still studied today perhaps is the fact that in spite of that he also wrote in a way that could be enjoyed by ordinary people and his poem addressed them, not just the establishment, not just the well-educated people in power. And consequently he was a very popular poet at the time and his work is studied a lot now. Now you can think that it could be argued this poem is propaganda. It's a piece of work that is meant to persuade a particular point of view. It celebrates the Victorian idea of an expanding empire. It celebrates the idea of British greatness. It's patriotic and that is one of the angles that you can think about when we start to read the poem. So we're going to listen to a reading of the poem now. Once we've heard it read aloud, then I'd encourage you to pause the video and read it several times yourself. And if you want to hear the poem performed differently, the way that someone performs a poem can really change how you feel about it. There are numerous readings online, but we've got one here for you to listen to. And as I've said, pause and then read a couple of times yourself just to let the poem really settle into your mind before we start to do the analysis. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death, rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death, rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die. 
into the valley of death, rode the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of six hundred, when can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made! All the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the light brigade. Noble 600. OK, so we've talked about the title of the poem. The title of the poem actually represents this particular historical event, the charge of the light brigade, putting the light brigade as the absolute focus of this poem and what's happening. Now, there are some things about the poem, about its form, its structure, that are helpful to know before we do a close reading. So let's first of all think about the fact that it relies on the form of a ballad. So I've already said that Tennyson liked to look at sort of historical literature and borrow from those traditions. He also apparently would sing a lot of his poetry before he wrote it down, and certainly with this poem it's reported that he sang it before he actually wrote it. And he wrote this poem within six weeks of the actual charge of the Light Brigade, so you can see it's a very sort of instinctive, quick reaction that he wanted to get his thoughts published as quickly as he could after the event. A ballad is a poem or a song that tells a story, usually in short stanzas, and you can see how this poem fits that tradition. It's telling us a story, it's song-like in that it's got repeated patterns that happen that we'll talk about a bit more when we look at the poem. It's written in six stanzas, they're not equal, and actually a lot of this poem follows a sort of free verse structure in that it doesn't follow particularly strict rules. It uses Roman numerals to give each stanza a sort of chapter heading, if you like, and what that does is it just shows the kind of organised response to telling the story of this doomed mission. There's an unpredictable, chaotic feel like the battle because there are no clear patterns and the stanzas are all slightly different and we can talk about the metre of this poem, the rhythm through accented and unaccented syllables as being very deliberately a relentless beat that could suggest the idea of the horses, the galloping horses. Now if you really want to go into more detail then you could start to do some research on the idea of dactyls. This poem's actually written in dactylic dimeter, which means that it follows a particular pattern of the galloping horses. So it uses a dactyl, a dactyl foot, which is a long syllable followed by two short syllables, and then there are two feet per line. Now that's very technical. Most of you don't even need to think about this, but if you really enjoy looking at the sort of science of poetry, then that's something you could go away and look at. What all of you need to think about, though, is the idea that the rhythm of this poem reflects the idea of the galloping horses and the chaos of the charge and how that's a really clever way of giving this poem mood and tone. It gives it almost a cheerful song-like rhythm, even though what it's talking about is actually the death of so many people, this rhythm helps give a sense of celebration. You can actually hear a very faint, tinny recording of Tennyson reading this poem himself. Now, it's obviously a very old recording, but it is available online. It's quite interesting to hear how he reads using that rhythm to give the poem its mood. The last thing we'll say then is about the speaker. It's an anonymous speaker in this poem, but clearly a very patriotic speaker. 
Doing that removes us as the reader from the soldier's experience. We're sort of observing and admiring what is happening to them from afar. And that helps us then be able to admire them as heroes. So stanza one. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Now we've got immediate repetition. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. And you can hear the immediate repetitive sound of the horses there as well. A league, by the way, in case you're interested, is about one and a half miles in length. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Now, we've got a constant focus on the numbers of soldiers involved. And that helps with the sense of scale, which then helps us realise just what a terrible tragedy this was. And you'll also notice we've got two references already to the Valley of Death. Now, this particular place is called the Valley of Death, literally, but it's also metaphorical. And it very cleverly links to biblical references, because there is a psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23, where there is a reference to the idea of a valley of death. Here's the quotation from the Bible. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, all the way through the poem, the valley of death becomes a refrain. That means that it becomes something that's deliberately repeated, an image that we keep coming back to. And it's a clever image to keep coming back to because it almost becomes quite a comforting image, even though when you first read it, it sounds like it's linked, well it is linked with this idea that so many of them are going to die. But actually when we look at it in the context of the Bible quotation, we could say that it's a reference to the fact that God is on their side, that God is with these soldiers. So we've got some dialogue, we've got the quotations from the people leading the charge, forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, all of this adding this sense of immediacy and the sense of drama to this being a military battle with lots of action. And we've also got personification, the valley of death. So death has got a capital D, which suggests personifying this place where they're going. And this idea of the breathless short lines and the thundering rhythm, we're thrown straight away into the action of this poem. And that continues in the second stanza. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die into the valley of death, rode the 600. So we've got that rhetorical question, was there a man dismayed? And the idea of there being a question that's not answered and isn't actually asked through dialogue, what is going on? Why are they being asked to go into this charge? Because all of the soldiers there know that what they're being asked to do is wrong, can't really be right, is going to end in certain death for so many of them. But what makes this poem so powerful and what gives it its theme is the idea that even though the soldiers know what they're being asked to do is incredibly dangerous, none of them question it. And Tennyson lets us know as the reader that there has been a mistake, that somebody is responsible for this error. But he doesn't focus the poem on blame. He gives us this subtle clue. He makes sure that we're aware this mistake has been made. But it's offered as if, well, mistakes do happen in war. And let's focus on the pride that we should have in our soldiers. So not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. And that final line there, there's but to do and die, absolutely sums up that these soldiers, no matter what they're about to head into, they put their duty to those who are in charge and to their country above all else, even though it's inevitable that so many of them are going to die. And that technique of starting those lines, there's not, there's not, there's but, is called anaphora. And the anaphora, what it does is it absolutely sort of drums in this idea of the soldiers as the heroes, their bravery, their duty, their acceptance of military hierarchy. And it absolutely drums into us like the drumming of the horse's feet as they charge down the valley. And of course, where they're charging is into the valley of death. So that image, that symbolism, yet again, rode the 600. And your 100 obviously rhymes with blundered. There is rhyme in this poem, but there's not a regular pattern of it. 
it's quite significant that the word blundered and then that final line hundred are linked together. You could look at how even though Tennyson doesn't want to make the mistake the focus of the poem, he does deliberately use that idea to make sure that we're all clear that this was a tragedy that perhaps could have been avoided. So we go straight into stanza three with some more anaphora here. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. So we immediately through that anaphora of the cannons to the right, cannons to the left, cannons in front, it's absolutely clear that these cannons, they can't escape them, it's inescapable this valley, they are absolutely surrounded by danger. And through really powerful verbs we've got the volleyed and the thundered and the stormed and then riding it's all about the physical bravery that the soldiers have to show in this really noisy dangerous environment boldly they rode and well so we've got that adverb boldly that tells us that Tennyson as a poet is setting them up to be admired by us as the reader and where they're boldly riding is into the jaws of death. So we have another metaphor, more personification into the mouth of hell, where we have this image of this sort of threatening jaws that are going to kind of eat them up, the horrors of the battlefield as a whole, and this continuing idea that death is inevitable. Road to 600. So impending doom, the foreshadowing that everything these soldiers are doing bravely without questioning is sending them to their deaths. Now until this point we've had the build-up to these soldiers approaching the guns and once we get to stanza four we now reach the moment where they are absolutely in the main firing range of the Russian guns. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wandered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Now a sabre is a sword, and there's an obvious deliberate opposition and contrast set up here by Tennyson between the sort of valiant flashing of their swords against guns and cannons that we've been hearing about before in the poem. So all of this serves to show us the bravery of these soldiers against all odds, the British soldiers as having all the heroic imagery in this poem. Their swords are flashing as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there. So we've got swordsmen against gunners, yet it's the swordsmen that sound the most heroic and seem most powerful, even though we know the reality of what happened is that the gunners mostly overwhelmed them. Charging an army while all the world wandered. Now, I think the poem's pace slows down a bit there because of that alliteration, while world wandered. It certainly pulls those words together and creates this sense of awe that the audience, the whole world, is wandering and marvelling at the amazing heroism of these soldiers. But then the pace picks up immediately again and we get lots of verbs all linked to this kind of negative, violent experience that they find. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. So we've got the sibilance there of sabre stroke, shattered, sundered, all reflecting the viciousness of the battle. It's a desperate feel to this part. We've got the enjambement, then they rode back, but not, not the 600. So we have this idea that the lines where it's not at the end of one line, we get the punctuation, it spreads over two lines in those final two lines there. It gives us this sort of short gasp, the reality that actually not all of them are going to be able to retreat and turn back and go back to safety. And hopefully you notice there's a lot of sensory imagery in this poem. There's vivid senses of the sounds particularly, but you know, smells, appearance of the battle, but particularly sound being used to create this hellish setting for such a violent battle. And you can go through the poem and find words that are linked to those senses. There's military language too, but it's really the sound imagery that creates the power, the action, the energy in the poem. There are no graphic descriptions of blood and guts, it's actually all about the action and the energy and the sound of the fighting. So on to stanza five. 
cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of 600. So we now have the Light Brigade in retreat and you see the repetition using the anaphora again. They have to turn back and go back through those cannons that are surrounding them. So it's this constant sense of no escape from the danger. We've got more sibilants again stormed at with shot and shell. So the viciousness remains um, while horse and hero fell. So different alliteration there with the horse and the hero putting them together as this iconic image of the Light Brigade being both horse and soldier working as one. They that had fought so well, and Tennyson doesn't hide his praise and admiration all the way through this poem, the sense that the speaker is astonished that they've made it back, that some of them are able to come back through the jaws of death from the mouth of hell. But then when we get towards the end of this stanza, we're reminded through use of that number all that was left of them, left of 600, that not many come back at all. Now we can call this metonymy, this idea of not using the words the light brigade, but constantly referring to them as the 600. And using this metonymy, what it does is it brings the soldiers together as one group with a shared purpose, but through using the number, it really gives us that sense of scale again. And then when we find out that so few of them came back, that's what created the shock and the controversy and the horror around this particular story. And then our final stanza, you'll notice this shorter again, so stanza six, when can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wandered, honour the charge they made, honour the light brigade, noble 600. So we start with an interrogation, a challenge to the reader through that rhetorical question. The answer's clear, when can their glory fade? Well, through the poem, what Tennyson is trying to say is their glory can never fade, they must be remembered. He's used his poem as a way of keeping that glory alive, of putting it down in something that he hopes will be permanent. And that second line has got almost a feeling of delight about it, especially through starting with sort of, oh, the wild charge they made, is an exclamation and that adds to this sense of amazement and awe about what they've managed to achieve rather than concentrating on what they've lost. All the world wandered. Again, we've got the wild, the world, the wandered. That alliteration slowing the pace and giving this a real, really theatrical, dramatic sense in recreating the excitement of warfare and how we mustn't forget this amazing story. Honour the charge they made. Honour the Light Brigade. So that repetition and that giving us an imperative, kind of telling us as the reader what we've got to do. We must honour them. And by honour them, it means we must remember them and respect them and keep telling their story. Honour the Light Brigade, noble 600. And he saves that adjective noble for that last line. So there's absolutely no escape from what his view is as the speaker, as the poet, to tell us that we must not let their glory fade. And throughout the poem, you might have noticed there's quite a lot of end stops. What that means are lines where we do reach a full stop, where there's a sense of certainty. This isn't a poem where there are great long stanzas that never actually get to the end of a sentence. And that gives this poem a really confident feel that it's a poem that we're meant to feel is certain in its view and how we should interpret what the message is. And it's a poem of mourning. It is a poem that's sad about the loss of life, but it's also glorifying the courage of those who died and those who survived. And people who admire this poem see it as a tribute to the Light Brigade's selfless courage. People who have historically or now attacked the poem see it as overly sentimental and glorifying the British Empire, glorifying war, when that's not what we should be concentrating on from this story. You might have your own views about what you think of it. So now we've looked at the detail of the poem and how it's written, let's just before we end think about how you might compare this poem with other poems in your anthology. Every single poem in the anthology could be compared 
in charge of the light brigade i'm not giving you every single idea or every single poem i've just picked out a few that i think make particularly interesting comparisons when you're thinking about them so let's start with ozymandias by shelley in both of these poems we've got an exploration of the theme of pride but for such different purposes. So there are lots of things about these poems that are actually different, but what you could argue holds them together is this exploration of pride and how it's important to us. In London by Blake, again, two very different poems in many ways. In both poems, there's a speaker who's commenting on society in some way, but Tennyson, as the poet, is upholding societal values of his time. He is trying to protect society and celebrate what's happening, whereas Blake used his poetry to absolutely condemn what he could see was happening in society. So in Owen's poem, Exposure, Owen's account of conflict is critical of those in power and absolutely lacks any patriotic sentiment. Tennyson acknowledges the mistakes of those in power, so there is some similarity to a little point. However, in spite of knowing that mistakes were made by those in power, Tennyson still chooses to prioritise glorifying the sacrifice of the soldiers. And interesting to look at the context and think about why that might be. So another obviously war poem, in Bayonet Charge by Hughes, both poems portray a feeling of inevitable death in conflict, with Hughes choosing to focus on one individual soldier and Tennyson commenting on a group of soldiers. The theme of patriotism is given a very different perspective in each, but obviously you can look at how they sort of stick together through this exploration of conflict and inevitable death and what they do with those ideas, the two poets. In Remains by Armitage, we've had a conflict that's inspired two poets in two different times to write about the experiences of soldiers, both touching on the possibility and impact of mistakes that are made in conflict. I think that's a really interesting comparison there. And then in Poppies by Jane Weir, we've got the exploration of the impact of conflict and grief from a personal perspective, whereas Tennyson is also looking at the impact of conflict and grief, but in a very public commemoration and celebration of that sacrifice. And then finally, in Kamikaze, we've got two poems that explore the power of patriotism and the idea of duty, which features very strongly in both poems, but in very different contexts. So another really interesting one there. So I hope that that's helped you feel more confident in your reading and understanding of the feelings and attitudes in the poem The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Hopefully you now feel like you've got more information about how you could explore and analyse the effect of language, form and structure in a poem. Not just describe what the poet does, but think about the effect, the impact on us, how it helps us respond to that poem. And then finally, we started off this video by looking quite closely at the context, the history behind the poem, the history of Tennyson and why he wrote the poem. And whilst you don't need to remember the details of that history, having that understanding will enable you to talk about why he would have written a poem which seems to glorify something that was such a terrible tragedy. Thanks for listening.